recently I found out about this. Just absolutely another disgusting thing. You, you read the Bible and you see a very strong hatred for Mystery Babylon there. And, and she's the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And when you really start to understand things and you start to research, you realize, yeah, it does tie back to the Catholic Church. Almost every single evil thing in this world ties back to the Catholic Church in some way. And here we have another example of that. John Lafarge Jr. C, uh, S.J., Society of Jesus, he's a Jesuit, was an American Jesuit Catholic priest known for his activism against racism and anti-Semitism. Involved in the heyday and eventual breakup of Thomas Wyatt Turner's Federated Collared Catholics, Lafarge went on to found a short-lived offshoot, the Catholic Interracial Council. You can see, you know, 1880, I was born and died in 1963. So he's been in hell for a little while now, burning, praise the Lord. In the run-up to World War II, he worked on a draft of a papal encyclical, encyclical against racist and totalitarian ideologies for Pope Pius the 11th. Yeah, you know, it's real good there, you know, the totalitarian ideologies, kind of like Catholicism, entitled Humani Generis Unitas, uh, sounds like uniting, you know, humanity there. Yeah, though it was never promulgated due to the death of Pius the 11th on February 10th, 1939. Um, uh, John Lafarge was born, you can uh, read some of the stuff here, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I uh, thought that was interesting. Uh, his mother, Margaret Mason Perry Laforge, uh, Lafarge, was a granddaughter of Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry and a great great granddaughter of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was an occultist, Freemason. Um, he was not a, a very good man, uh, pretty wicked. Lafarge was gifted at music and languages, eventually becoming fluent in both French and German. At the age of 10, he edited The Sunlight, a monthly magazine put out by a group of his friends, one of whom had access to a hand printing press, blah, blah, blah. But their family you know, knew all these different big influential people. He went to Harvard. Lafarge was drawn to the priesthood early, though he also considered careers in the Navy or the professorate. In the fall of 1901, he went to Austria to study theology at the University of Innsbruck. On 26th July, I think that's a misprint, July 26, 1905, he was ordained a priest in Innsbruck and joined the Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits. He returned to the United States, where in the fall, the Jesuits sent him to St. Andrew on Hudson in Hyde Park, New York, for his novitiate years in the Society. In 1907, he was sent to Canisius College in Buffalo, New York to teach humanities to freshmen for a semester and then to Loyola University, Maryland for another semester of teaching. He afterwards spent two years at Woodstock College in Maryland where he received his master's de degree in philosophy. Take heed lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Yeah, unless you're a Jesuit then you don't have to. Lafarge was plagued by ill health through out his youth and the completion of his MA degree left him severely exhausted. His superiors advised him that he pro probably couldn't support the rigors of life as a scholar. He moved into pastoral work, spending 15 years ministering to mainly African American and, and immigrant communities in rural St. Mar Mary's County, um, Maryland, along Chesapeake Bay. His work was de here deeply shaped his attitude to race relations and to racism, which he considered a sin. He spoke out publicly against the conditions under which African Americans lived, and he demonstrated special interest in furthering education for disadvantaged communities. In 1926, he founded an industrial school in Southern Maryland for African American boys, the Cardinal Gibbons Institute. In 1926, Lafarge left his pastoral work in Maryland to become assistant editor of America, a leading Jesuit weekly magazine in the United States, still in print today. He went on to, at least as far as I know, went on to become its fifth editor-in-chief in 1944. Acknowledged, acknowledging that he was not a great administrator, he stepped down after four years and assumed the position of associate editor. All told, he worked on the magazine for 37 years, and he is credited with establishing a progressive editorial tone that the magazine had has largely retained. He described himself as a priest who was also a working journalist, someone whose main task it was to study the events of the day and to connect them 
with deep moral and theological questions. Not the Bible, but just papist teaching. His writings in newspaper articles on racism attracted broad public attention in the United States and abroad. In addition to his work for America, he published his writing in such publications as Common Wheel, the Saturday Review, blah, blah, Catholic World, Catholic World, as well as turning out several dozen books reviewed, book reviews each year for various magazines and newspapers. In 1937, Lafarge published what would become his most important book on racism, Interracial Justice, a study on the, of the Catholic doctrine of race relations. In it, he argued that against then prevalent ideas about the innate inferiority, inferiority of Amer African Americans and for the position that social disparities stemmed from the long-standing economic and cultural mistreatment of African Americans at the hands of America's ruling classes. He also argued vigorously, vigorously against segregation and the separate but equal doctrine. Hmm. Integrationist, in other words. A revised and expanded edition was published in 1943 under the title The Race Question and the Negro. Now, let me just explain something to you here. If you are not aware of what the Bible teaches, the Bible does not teach superior races, but the Bible does teach separation. All right, let me just put this here. Genesis chapter 11, you get down through here, they're trying to become one. And the Lord said, verse 6, Behold, the people is one. And they have all the one language, and that's to begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Not because people are bad, and we hate black people, and, and oh, I hate white people, and I hate Asian people. That's not it. God wants diversity. He wants people to be split up. Segregation is God's system, not through hatred of another people, another ethnicity, but you keep people separate. God wants preservation of culture there. That's why in the New Testament, the, the people that got saved, the Gentiles that got saved, didn't have to make themselves into Jews. Okay, very important to remember that. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let me show you this real quick. Deuteronomy 32. <clears throat> verse 7, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, and he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. They're supposed to be division, separation. They're not supposed to have uh, integration. Integration is a satanic system. Period. I don't care what you have to say about that. Uh, people's opinions on that don't mean anything to me. I know what the Bible teaches. You say, well, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Okay. Then let's go to the New Testament. Now, let's think of where it is. All right. Verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Sorry, church buildings. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. That's where most people stop. They don't go on to this. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Boundaries. Separation. Unless you're a papist devil like this Lafarge guy. Why? Why is it important to stay separate? That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You see, what happens when you merge people together and cultures together and, and everything else, you have to start to compromise to get along with everybody else. And pretty soon, compromise leads to destruction of the gospel. Destruction of Bible-believing Christianity, of segregation. True biblical segregation is not a bad thing. It's not based on hate. It's based on love and respect for other people's cultures. I love and respect people's culture over in Africa, but don't try to force it on me. You see? That's what's going on here. And that's why this papist devil here, this guy, was coming out against all this stuff. 
And he's the one that, that started a lot of the thing of interracial marriage in this country. And then two Jesuit lawyers were the ones that did that were there with the Loving versus Virginia case, which I've proved in another video. It all ties back to the Jesuits. It all ties back to Counter-Reformation. It all ties back to the destruction of culture, whereby you can control the people and destroy people. It's right there. Uh, one of the people impressed by Lafarge's arguments was Pius, Pope Pius XI, who invited him to secretly prepare an encyclical on racialism, the topic he considered to be the most burning one of the time. The superior general of the Jesuits subsequently assigned two other priests, fathers Gustav Gundlach and Gustav Despiqui, to join Lafarge in this task, entitled Humani Generis Unitis, on the hum unity of the human race. Hello, did you get it? And look who did it. The superior general of the Jesuits, the black pope. Is a uh, integration an interracial marriage? Is it, a, is it an important thing to the Jesuits? Yes, because that's how they destroy culture. That's how they destroy what God created. It's the Tower of Babel all over again. You can't have a new world order if people are segregated and separated and respecting one another's culture. Yeah. From his first three words, it was drafted during the summer of 1938 and given to Pius XI near the end of the year. And by the way, why was it secret? Secretly prepared. Why is it secret? Hmm. It encompassed a general critique of modern ideas such as the state and race that have diminished human dignity and argued against the moral evils of racism and anti-Semitism. See, they'll, they'll throw in racism is evil, anti-Semitism is evil, but they're twisting it. They're tweaking the the definitions of this stuff, you know, such as the state, you know, modern ideas such as the state, uh, no separation. It was not promulgated, promulgated, however, because Pius XI died in early 1939, and his successor, Pope Pius XII, held it back, only taking a few extracts for use in some later encycl encyclicals. For several decades, it lingered in the obscurity of the Vatican archives until the researches of George, or whatever you say his name there, Bernard Suchecki brought the story to light in the 1990s. Nice. In June 1934, Lafarge founded the Catholic Interracial Council of New York to combat racism. These councils proliferated across America over the next two decades, and in 1959, they merged to become the National Catholic Conference on Interracial Justice. As Lafarge's reputation grew, he was given other visible and important offices. At various times, he was chaplain of the Society of the Catholic Laity, an officer of the Catholic Association for International Peace, vice president of the American Catholic Historical Association, and chaplain of the Liturgical Society of Arts. In 1947, Lafarge was invited to give the prestigious Dudleian Dude Lecture at Harvard, whatever, a bunch of over-philosophized uh, losers that don't know how to work, do any kind of physical work, whatever. He chose for his topic uh, juridic wholeness, arguing that human rights must apply universally, not just to select groups. Yeah. Lafarge's role as a champion of racial justice was sometimes marred by paternalistic attitudes and, in some people's eyes, by his anti communism, uh, which is, it's a, what a joke. Anti communism for a Jesuit. Jesuits are some of the masters of communism, they created communism. Okay, communal living. Uh, okay, vow of poverty. <laughs> You know, vow, vow of obedience, vow of chastity, all these vows that they take. It's communism. You know, it's anti-communism. Oh, please, give me a break. He did not play a major role in the civil rights movement of the late 1950s and early 1960s, in part because he was well into his 70s by then. Yeah, but his philosophies led to that stuff. However, just three months before his death, Lafarge walked in in the 1963 March on Washington and stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial be behind Martin Luther King, Jr., for his famous I Have a uh, Dream speech, a public acknowledgement of Lafarge's early role in a movement for racial equality that was now being led by others. At his eulogy, Boston's Cardinal Richard Cushing spoke of him as a pioneer in the field of interracial justice. So, you know, good old Wikipedia here, you know, just showing this because it shows the basics of it, whatever. But, you know, cracks me up here. Um, he did not play a major role in the civil rights movement. 
He just stood behind Martin Luther King Jr. when he was giving his speech. <laughs> okay, sure, yeah, right, whatever. But you know, he's he's given these these uh you know the Liberty Medallion of the American Jewish Committee, um, you know the the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. The Jews are almost completely controlled by the Jesuits. You know the the Jesuits use them as their as their fall guys for stupid things. And the Jews are drawn in by the money and the power that the Jesuits offer them. So, if you don't get that, again, I feel bad for you. But you get down through here to the Society of Jesus, you know, the Counter-Reformation there, which I've talked about. It's a matter of historical fact. It's not just my, you know, conspiratorial paranoid ramblings or something like this. Um, the Jesuits are the most disgusting group of people that are on this planet. Um, if I had my way, I'd like to see every single one of them executed publicly. Um, probably not going to happen until the Lord uh, comes back, which will be fun then. We'll have some real fun with the Jesuits. But uh, just disgusting, sickening, you know, another proof of what I've been saying. The whole interracial marriage, interracial, all this stuff. Uh, Jesuit, founded it. Jesuit priest. Why am I not surprised? 